Live from New York, it's Access Engineer. Hey everybody, it's me, Lady Ada, with me, Mr. Lady Ada. We're here at the Adafruit factory in downtown Manhattan. It's where we do all of our testing and coding and manufacturing and shipping, all the stuff that you love, is made right here in downtown Manhattan. Uh, with me, Mr. Lady Ada. Uh, we live together, which is why we don't have masks on. Uh, normally we have masks I'll on in I'll talk about some, some updates with uh, COVID-related news and more. Still doing it. Yeah. All pretty, right. pretty soon we're not going to have to. I hope so. Let's get right into it then. What's on tonight's show? On tonight's show, the code is magnetic. 10% on off all things in a fruit store that's in stock all the way up to 11.59 p.m. Use it. 10% off in the Adafruit store. We have a bunch of live shows. We're going to talk about those, including show and tell. We're going to do some time travel. we got a bunch of stuff. We've been posting a lot of retro things and more. Help Wanted, jobs from the Adafruit Jobs Board. We've got 3D printing. We've got new products. We've got top secret. We answer your questions. We do that on Discord, adafruit.it slash Discord. Join all 32,000 of us. Hang out all the time. All that and more on, you guessed it, Ask an Engineer. All right, so the code is magnetic. Don't forget, use that, put stuff in your cart, and then before you check out, use that. Let me do just a quick bit of news. So for those of y'all who know us, the first two weeks of the year was tough. Um, everyone came back from holiday, various forms of getting tested, uh, folks getting positive results uh, for COVID, and then, um, Good news, no symptoms. Um, Adafruit team happens to be fully vaccinated, boosted, ready to go, uh, but you know, their family members or friends or whatever, lots of folks were testing positive and the numbers went up, 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 but as of now, they're going down, 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 down. So we're almost back Ooh. to single digit um, positivity rates. If you look at these charts, it went up as fast as it went down. And What's that chart? This is, uh, I think, hospitalizations. Mm. And then I think this is people ICU. Uh, in the ICU. Yeah. So it's going down really fast. That's the good news. Um, and then uh, we have a rapid test for our team. We have a little machine that we got. Um, it arrived and we were doing tested, uh, testing. Lady Ada has no COVID. Um, I have no COVID. And other people here have no COVID. So that's good. Um, and then masks are going out, um, I guess, to millions of people. And then also folks can go online and order a free test. So That's right. looks like we're through. The worst of it, we'll see um, how it goes. But um, we're almost at a finish line. But, you know, this is this victory has been snatched from us before. So that's a little bit of an update. We're still, you know, grinding away. Thank you, everyone, for all your orders and support. Um, you know, we're, we're dealing with multiple things from supply chain, from part shortages to... Um, it's just being very difficult to, 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 to live your life when this is going on. So um, we do appreciate the support, and thank you very much. Speaking of, um, don't pay full price. Use the code MAGNETIC. You get free stuff. That's right. We are still uh, keeping free stuff. We're going to um, get back to having more cool freebies, um, but it's really hard to get parts right now. Um, and so it, what's interesting is that it's, um, it's even though it's been almost two years, it's still quite hard to, to get some things that haven't gotten easier. But uh, we still have some freebies, $99 or more, you get a free half-sized Perma Proto board. Um, we love using these all the time for our projects. They're the size of, of a solderless breadboard, um, but with gold pads so you can solder your project and make it permanent. Um, 149 or more, we still have a selection of STEM QT sensors and boards. You get a uh, free one with every order. Um, you get a different one each time. If you make an account, we'll make sure that we don't send you the same one twice. And then uh, $2.99 or more, you get free UPS ground shipping in the continental United States. Uh, we're out of circuit playground expresses. We had some, and then they instantly sold out, which is good. They're going to students and schools. Um, we're going to have another shipment, and we'll get back to that, having that freebie real soon now. Okay. We do a live series of shows every single week. We just finished up Show & Tell. It's every Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time. We had a bunch of folks on the Show & Tell um, I think this week... A lot of music stuff. Lots of music stuff. Sin, sin, sin. And uh, I like the clock that Jepler did. Mm. And then Tim, funny guy, did this really neat uh, cat screensaver thing that you wanted to do. Yes. I love old screensavers. Yeah. And we, um, we did flying toasters a while ago, but then I remembered uh, Nico, which is a um, little cat that would uh, run around on my Mac Classic, um, my, my SE30, I think I had it on. And... Uh, I really wanted to relive those days, and he did a great job taking the pixel art and turning it into a little um, animation in CircuitPython. Yeah. On Sundays, we do Desk of Lady Data. 
we have two parts. The first part, we talk about what's on your desk. What was this week's Desk of Lady Ada? Oh, goodness. What was it? Um, uh, much more floppy stuff. I designed a new uh, Feather ESP32 um, with a new Pico module. I did, I've done, I did a five and a quarter inch floppy interfacing and reading, adding support for 360K floppies. So, you know, the floppy stuff is going. It's not going to be super fast, uh, but floppies aren't very fast. And um, also a couple of cutie pie boards that I designed. I showed those off as well. All right. And then we do the great search. This has been really useful, especially over the last year or so. Uh, this is where Lady Ada uses all of her powers of engineering to help you find things on digikey.com. What was a great search? This I this do week? remember. This one, it was the, I was looking for the, um, for a very small stereo headphone amp that doesn't require capacitors on the output because it needs to fit into very tiny space. And I also have to be in stock. And so um, I found a good one from Maxim and um, showed how I spec the part and uh, why I picked it. Um, and also some things to watch out for when doing looking for these headphone amps. Okay. And then uh, we do JP's product pick every Tuesday. And that is a live show that's from the product page. And the discount's automatically applied. So you can just see what JP's talking about. Add it to your cart, you don't have to do nothing else, and it's just for the live show. That's the only time we do it, and it's a super good deal, and that's why we can only do it for a little bit of time. So here's the highlight from this week, and don't forget, it's every Tuesday. It's the KB2040 Keyboard. This is the board you've been looking for if you've been wanting to do custom keyboard kits. This is the Gherkin, just the smallest of the smallest uh, usable keyboards. I realized last night and then Lady Ada texted me the, the exact same idea, which is this is now the, the world's ultimate Wordle uh, keyboard. If you know the game Wordle, uh, all we need is alphabetical. So I won't type any answers in here because I don't want to ruin this is today's game. Uh, but I'll show you that this is just a working keyboard. I can even try to press enter and it'll say that's not in the word list because that's not a, not a word. Uh, and I'll delete here, pull this little bottom plate. This one's made all of PCB FR4 material. So we have a key plate on top to hold the key steady. We have the PCB itself. And then we have our KB2040. There it is. It's the KB2040 keyboard. All right, and then tomorrow is JP's workshop, and on JP's workshop, we have a special segment, the Circuit Python Parsec. Take it away, JP. For the Circuit Python Parsec today, I wanted to show you how simple it is to set up capacitive touch sense inside of Circuit Python. So this is an example where I have a little cutie pie here, and I'm gonna use one of its pins as a capacitive touch pin, which means I can touch it or get really, really close to it without even touching it, and it'll sense the difference in the capacitive uh, storage potential of me and effectively close the circuit for me or touch, touch it uh, to create some sort of an effect inside of the code. So in this example, I just have one pin on here, the RX pin, and when I, can, when I touch it, you can see it's acting like a button. I just have it turning on a bunch of these LEDs here. I've got a funky, uh, I've got a broken NeoPixel ring here, so ignore these busted ones over here. Uh, but that is just uh, the same as any kind of button or switch that you could close, except it doesn't require an additional mechanical part. Uh, this is also really effective for when you want to cover something because you don't actually have to make contact with it. So you can use a piece of paper or fabric or something like that and still be able to touch something. So let's take a look at how this works. What's happening in code? I'm importing the board for pin definitions, importing time so I can put a little delay in, importing the touch IO library, and I'm importing NeoPixel. Then I set up a variable called touch pin, which equals touch IO dot touch in, and then the board dot RX pin or whatever pin you're using. Then I have a little bit of NeoPixel set up, and then it's just so simple. Inside of the main loop of the program, I just simply check to see if touch pin value is true. If it is true, then the things inside of this happen. LEDs get filled red. I print the word touch, and then I have a little sort of debounce pause there. Otherwise, it lifts the, uh, the pins back up to black. And so that's how easy it is to set up a capacitive touch pin inside of CircuitPython. And that is your CircuitPython Parsec. Oh. Okay, and then Friday, deep dive with Scott, where you'll learn all about the innards of Circuit 
Python. And I come by once in a while. And more, yeah. Time travel. Let's look around world of makers, hackers, artists, and engineers, news, and we have special look backs at Adafruit, retro stuff, and more this week. So time travel this week. Um, first up, we have to do the reminder. Adabox will be shipping, winter edition. That's what we're doing um, to make sure we can get all the parts that we need. It's so, yeah, it, <laughs> it's tough. We'll get it. Don't <laughs> we're worry. We're gonna get it. We're it, gonna get it. We've uh, we've shipped every single AdaBox. Even even during uh, the shutdown, we were able to get an AdaBox out. So thank you for your patience. But there's not a lot of AdaBoxes left. We only have so many slots. So winter edition will be shipping February, March, probably March. And um, go to AdaBox.com now. Um, I think there's like five openings left out of the thousands. So I so we've actually. Okay, I'm going to interrupt you. I'm sorry. But we, okay. um, Phil and I, over the last few weekends, we planned out this year, it's this 2022's Adabox. Oh, yeah, we have all the Adabox planned. It's going to be amazing. Like, yeah. we picked four, like, mwah, amazing. I mean, like, you're going to freak out. You're going to freak out. So you want to, like, get in because once, if you get in, you'll get them going forward. But if you don't get in, there's no guarantee that, you, you know, we don't kick people out, but you won't be able to get in if there's no slots. So. Yeah. It's worth it. Believe me, you're going to love the next four boxes. Yeah, you're going to forget. They're going to be, and, and they, they the, work together, but you don't need to use the them The thing that's in each one of these, they're going to sell out so fast in our store, which if it's a product, that you won't be able to get it. So, adabox.com, you should do it. We are securing the components. Yeah. Um, bit of a reminder, coming up pretty soon in February, Lady Ada is going to do a special chat with Tom's Hardware, and this is going to be the PiCast, celebrating 10 years of Raspberry Pi, new episodes with Lady Ada, Evan Upton, and more. You're going to be on February 15th, Lady Ada and Paul Beach of Pi Maroney. You're going to be talking about all the things Raspberry Pi related and more with our friends from Pi Maroney. Yes, you're going to hear some good stories from me and from Paul Beach. I'm going to talk about why we decided to do Raspberry Pi and the moment that it happened and Phil was there at the moment and it's like, it is crystal I clear. I know the the block and I know, this, I know the piece of sidewalk we were standing on. There was the fish market right next to it. I remember exactly when I turned to Phil and said, this Raspberry Pi thing, we gotta do this. Yeah. And why, and, but also like why, the story behind why. There's a gut reaction, but there's also a lot behind yeah. it. Um, Raspberry Pi is really interesting. We also had to postpone another product we were doing. So we were about to release a bunch of wearable stuff and we said, we can't do both, so we decided, let's delay some of the wearable things and let's do some Raspberry Pi stuff. And it all worked out like because- you, you make it sound so good, but meanwhile, I was just like, I'm like, I'm freaking out, I can't do both, Phil, what am I gonna do, what am I do? And you're just like, just do this one and then we'll do the other one. And I'm like, I yeah. can do that? <laughs> yeah, we're lucky. We plan our freak outs at different times. Yeah. So generally speaking, I'm up at 5 a.m. and Lamar's going to bed at 5 a.m. So our, our freak outs don't usually happen we, at the same time. Yes. Okay. Nocturnal and whatever yeah. the opposite of nocturnal if, is, dineural. <laughs> yeah, if you ask us independently, we've never seen each other freak out. Uh, we just do it alone and crying into our pillows. I know, but so, at different times. Different zones. times. Totally yeah. different. Uh, all right, so this photo was taken 15 years, nine months, and one day ago. This is the entire net worth of Lady Ada, all of Adafruit, all on a table. This is all she had, this is all she was. Not the lantern. I don't know what the lantern is there. That was a flashlight. But I don't remember needing it. I think we needed that because I think the bathroom light was, was broken. Yeah, you lived in like a crummy place with like 15 roommates <laughs> okay. and there was no power lived, or light. I lived with 10 people in a warehouse and we had one bathroom. Yeah. Let me tell the, you, the, nothing nothing changes the, you as a human like that. No dishwasher either. Um, there was no dishwasher. So it's true. this was uh, Lamore about to go to Maker Faire um, in 2006. And uh, I... I've, since I met Lamar, I've been documenting everything she does. Here is the window screen. Um, and then here is what we had. And she sold the kits at Maker Faire. There was folks on social media today who was like, oh, my God, I have one of those kits. Oh, my gosh. I was a customer. It still works. You know, and yeah, I still have it. You can still it. program it, too. Like, the tutorial will still work. Yeah. Um, so If you have a parallel port. <laughs> so that is a little uh, glimpse back. And I guess the thing I wanted to say is... Um, you know, it seems like a long time ago, 15, 16 years, um, a lot of people want to grow their companies fast. You know, we, it took us, you know, 15 years and here we are and here are all you. And um, we built something solid and sturdy and something that's getting us through, you know, some of the toughest times ever. So, um, you know, the hyper growth and, you know, fake it till you make it and just all these things that you see and um, people being terrible to each other. You don't have to do it that way. 
And I just wanted to show this picture of this table because that's that's the seed. That's that, my I, I care. That's everything. That's my initial kit offering. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, anyways, so uh, speaking of retro stuff, um, mm. we started a series of retro uh, hardware photos right before uh, COVID started. And then I had to press pause because we were only working on keeping our team safe. So we're finally getting these up and then more. So this is uh, one of the Apple speakers. This is kind of rare. This is the Apple design um, black version. Um, this is from my personal collection, the Adafruit collection. And then the other things, you're gonna like this. This we just took a photo of. This is a 1982 Pac-Man phone, back when Pac-Man was everywhere and it just launched in the US in 1980-ish. And then like Pac-Man just took over. And of course, you know, after I got these photos, this is a touchtone telephone. It's not a cell phone. Um, I had to make an animated GIF. <laughs> That's <laughs> the only thing <laughs> you want to do. Yeah, there's a Garfield phone. There's a hamburger phone, but my Pac-Man I phone. I think the Garfield really like phone it. is a little bit, you know, overdone. I think the Pac-Man phone yeah. is nice, especially like the the uh, coil on the cord. Oh, one thing. These aren't shot cups. These are full-size green cups. We still have these uh, in all the plastic cups. You put uh, your parts in an excellent system for making kits, yes. and then you pour it into the bag. You can do five by five, 25 kits at a time, and that was that was my system. Yeah. And then you could pour the cup contents into the silver bags. And the nice thing about that is um, you, because the cup is white, you can look and you can make sure you didn't, you know, sometimes a diode would get we stuck. We had it down. I had it down. And uh, back in the day, kidding, shipping. That was it, two people. And uh, here we are now, 130 plus uh, in a factory in New York City. So anything's possible. And uh, we've been playing the video game on the hard level. So I just wanted to, there's a lot of people starting businesses and they're like, it's been six months. How come it's taking so long? It's like, no, man, you got to wait a little bit longer and it's worth it. It's worth it. Just be patient. Yeah. Good things are ahead. Um, next up. So we've been doing a lot of retro floppy stuff. This is our little cute rabbit icon. Um, we're adding more um, Kind of like, I don't know, like tributes to like retro history. And since um, since there was the Winnie the Pooh um, uh, Freedom event where yeah. it goes out of copyright, uh, we have some uh, graphics in that style. And this is Rabbit. We don't, I don't know what the name of the rabbit's going to be yet. And uh, it's a floppy rabbit. I like rabbit. this one. Yeah, it's like, hey, like I'm just hanging on on these discs. And then this one is like, oh man, like I had a little bit too much to, to drink. <laughs> um, but yeah, a little, yeah, a little bit too much carrot juice. Um, but then we have, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. We have six videos all under one minute each. So we're going to play these back to back to back to back. And you can see our progress leading all the way up to you being able to get a five and a quarter disc showing up like a USB drive. Mass my, storage. I, I cooked my brain this weekend. I worked on it for like this, yeah. 12 hours so, straight. So hang out to the last video. It's only you know five minutes from now. Um, it is absolutely amazing because you can use this old floppy disk, five and a quarter, as a USB drive. That's Incredible. Right. Okay, there Great we go. for storing 360K of data. It's a lot. It's a lot. Of that data. is actually quite a lot. There's a lot you can do with 360K. None of the Python uh, code that I write anyways is n not that big. Yeah. You can see the Python on time. Yeah, okay. All right, data. what is this? More progress on our reading MFM floppies in Arduino and CircuitPython. Got my floppy disk drive and I've got it hooked up to my Feather M4. And then in Arduino, um, Jepler did a pull request to add uh, real-time MFM decoding so that like not just reading the flux data, but actually decoding it into data data. Um, this is assuming, of course, it's an MFM floppy, which it is. And then um, this is code that dumps each track. And so you can see over here why I put text files on this floppy disk because I can actually read it and make sure that I'm decoding it. And here's the trick. You can see at the end of this, it continues onto the next track. And so I know I'm like reading the interleave tracks correctly. Um, and so far it seems to be working. I can read all of the track data one by one from this floppy disk in Arduino with live on the fly MFM decoding. All right, data, what is this? This is even more floppy disk hacking. This time, uh, still got it wired up to my Feather M4, but I'm gonna be doing more USB hacking here because the Feather M4 has native USB. It can act as a USB device, which means I can run a teeny USB mass storage in Arduino, access the floppy disk drive through the MFM decoding, and have it show up in Windows as a floppy disk drive. And so you can see all those text files I copied over before appeared. 
You can see I can access this file, which happens to be an interview with Mudge. Pretty cool. Thank you, Mudge, for doing an interview with Frack. And uh, this is all in a PR um, that just got merged into the Adafruit floppy repo. So Arduino floppy disk reading is working. Um, next up, I want to get writing working so I can like store stuff onto disk drives. But I think this is the power of teeny USB. Like it's a native USB device. It can act as a floppy disk interface. Um, and Windows is happy to read the data from it. Early data, what is this? Okay, more and more floppy. Still got my fe uh, feather floppy wing. I've got my floppy drive with the diskette inside. What I'm doing now is, um, before I had the Arduino supply block data, 512 uh, byte blocks to the operating system, Windows, and that would interpret it as, with the USB to like show up as a disk drive. What I'm doing now is um, interpreting the FAT file system on the Arduino. So when I open up the serial monitor, it can actually read the disk drive, parse out you know the MFM to byte tracks, and then open that as a FAT uh, file system. And then I can read the file on um, the Arduino itself. So that means I can you know save and um, uh, read files from an Arduino, which is good for you know storing files, maybe data logging, and a project that I want to work on uh, where I read data from a floppy in Arduino. Hi, what is this? Hey, well, I'm doing some more floppy hacking tonight because it's so cold out. And, um, you know, I've got that three and a half inch drive working, but I also got a five and a quarter drive that I'd like to hook up. And I actually only have Commodore uh, 64 discs right now. And Commodore 64 isn't MFM uh, formatted. It's a different format. And so if I want to read these diskettes, I want to use a piece of software called Flux Engine. And Flux Engine is, is it's a very similar to Grease Weasel. In fact, it has Grease Weasel compatibility mode, um, but it's written in much more, more low level C and it supports a lot more formats. And I couldn't quite figure out that Grease Weasel supports Commodore 64. So what I'm doing is like slowly but surely figuring out how to get um, Flux Weasel to recognize, you know, this port and send data back and forth. I'm learning a lot about low level Windows uh, 32 file system access and COM ports. Um, but I'm making slow and steady progress. Really, data, what is this? This is, um, I did find one single DOS formatted five and a quarter floppy, and this is my five and a quarter drive, clunk. It's wired up to my feather, with my floppy feather wing, running my uh, Grease Weasel emulation mode. And what I got working was Flux Engine. So um, Flux Engine is another uh, software that can um, read uh, floppy disk drives uh, with Flux data and then parse it out. And um, I did get this working earlier, and I just want to quickly show this is what was on it. Uh, this is the image that I'm, you know, uh, opening up on my computer. So it's got all that mouse stuff that you're probably used to if you had a Windows computer running DOS back in the day. And um, this is Flux Engine if you're interested in it. It's kind of a cool open source Flux reader. And this is the pull request that hopefully I'll be able to get merged in soon. Early data, what is this? You spin me right round, baby, right round, like a floppy disk. Okay, so I've got my five and a quarter floppy disks. Not a good singer, good engineer. Got my five and a quarter drive wired up to my feather, and I'm now running the mass storage demo um, for Team USB, which means that this is actually showing up as a 360K uh, double density drive. I had to refactor a little bit here uh, so you can tell it, hey, for the MFM decoding, you're expecting 360, but here's the good news. It just shows up as a drive, and if you're like, hey, I wanna know what's in this readme.txt, it's a mouse driver for you know an old IBM PC, but it shows up just like a disk drive. This is a good example of why you can't just use a USB floppy disk because there's no such thing as a 360K IBM USB floppy drive, but now there is. All right. So thanks for being part of this journey. We're still doing a lot more. Um, I think this is the only open source way to do this that there, I know. There's open source ways to, well, for the USB, having it mounted as a USB drive, I don't know that there's any other, um, yeah. I don't know if there's any open source five and a quarter inch compatible. No, there isn't. I think there's emulators, um, but yeah. you know, it's all kind of the same code. That's the thing. It's like I'm doing like the archiving, the writing, the reading, the, um, yeah. Emulation, you know, showing up as a mass storage is all kind of like part of one big project. I, I do have a favor. If y'all see people online saying like, you could just get a USB 
drive from Amazon converter. I got, like, like, it's, it's, not, it's not true. It's not true. So you can't just get a USB drive from Amazon that you plug into any computer and it shows up. It just, it's not yeah. possible. Um, but, you know, way to go Amazon where people just assume that that's possible. Um, okay. and, and, you know, don't be mean or anything. Just point them to this video. It's actually like this is a pretty uh, intense project that you've been working on. And we're doing everything open source. So even yeah. even if there's commercial solutions out there that are expensive and you have to get all the special hardware, we're doing this that you could do with low-cost electronics. And I'm trying to do it black box because I don't want to, you know, get in the way of, yeah. you know, some people's products are like, oh, if you know, reverse engineer it, and they're like really sensitive about that. So I'm just doing it from scratch. So it's going slowly, but... Yeah, over the next few months, you're going to see, you know, more and more progress. Yeah, we'll have Commodore support. We're going to do everything. Yeah. It'll be there. So in the show and tell um, tonight, Kevin stopped by from DigiKey, and they're doing a special project with the DigiKeyer because it's DigiKey's 50th anniversary. And I said, oh, I actually have a video lined up tonight. It's the 1991 DigiKey promotional video. If you want to see what was going on in 1991 with state-of-the-art electronics, computers, and ordering parts via the telephone... Um, watch this video, it's only 48 seconds. It started in 1972. An idea, a new concept in distribution. Today, DigiKey Corporation represents one of the fastest growing electronic component distributors in the United States. At DigiKey, service is the key. The success of this effort depends on a team of talents, employees, management, and staff committed to making DigiKey the best. In its first 10 years, DigiKey's marketing efforts were focused on the electronic hobbyist. Then, in 1982, they began targeting catalog mailings to the commercial market. Okay, let's do some help wanted. We have jobs.adafruit.com where you can post up your skills or if you're a company looking for people to hire, go to jobs.adafruit.com and post up the job. This week the job is from an electrical embedded engineer for Synchron in Brooklyn, New York. And this, uh, and let me just pull down this thing, is for a Ooh. Platform for brain interface technology that transmits, transmits data in and out of brain devices implanted inside cerebral blood vessels using minimally invasive endovascular procedures. Um, so basically this is one of those things that might help people be able to do things like walk or move or lots of different stuff. Well, it could be very neat. And it's uh, here in New York. It's full time. It's an engineering job. Check it out at jobs.adafruit.com. Okay, next up we have... Python on hardware. Yay! All right. Blinka, blinka. So, a um, few things, and we have so much Python on hardware stuff, we have to pick our favorites. So, I'm going to skip these couple things right now. Um, I'm going to do this, and then we're going to go to the two highlights of the week. So, please get your what you want in CircuitPython 2022. You can tag it, you can post it, you can look at our videos, you can you name it, just, just hashtag CircuitPython2020 to, uh, to the blog, and you can also um, email it to us. Whatever you want to do, get it to us, uh, because you help shape CircuitPython. It's not too late. It isn't too late. Um, we go over some of the stuff we've been doing with this, this floppy work, and then um, a ton of projects. It is never-ending. There is so much going on with Python on hardware. We're having a hard time keeping up with it. The newsletter is getting bigger and bigger. Uh, subscribe, go to Adafruit Daily. I'll talk about that in a second. But the two things this week that I think is big and interesting news, if you love your brand, if you love your thing, set it free. So there is a show called the CircuitPython Show podcast, a podcast with people in and around CircuitPython, and we have nothing to do with it. Nothing. Yay. And Not the, re me. the reason I say yay is because CircuitPython um, has, is, and will be bigger than uh, an Adafruit project. We fund it. We support it. It's all open source. But um, it's circuitpython.org. You can look at all 250-plus boards that are there. Most boards aren't even from Adafruit. And um, we're really proud of that because uh, people want to use this for business. They want to use it for things. Um, competitors of ours use it. That's what... Our, when we light another candle, it doesn't diminish our flame. And so um, we're thankful that we got it started, but we're also uh, extra thankful that people are carrying the torch, so to speak, 
and doing shows that we just won't have time for. We do and this show. We do this show. We do a bunch of shows. And Scott has a thing, and we have a thing, and we do a thing every Tuesday, and we have another thing. On Mondays, we have our community chat. And so um, there's tons of Python books. There's tons of Python podcasts. There's tons of Python videos. And I think we're seeing the same thing with CircuitPython now. So speaking of, um, CircuitPython is a friendly fork. Uh, we work with MicroPython, that team over there, mm-hmm. and uh, we like to merge and like to do stuff. Uh, we do a couple different things, uh, but what we do is try to make sure there's parity between the two by working with them. And there's a new release, 1.18. Lady yes. Ada, what is in the latest MicroPython? Lots of little speed ups, uh, a lot of bug fixes, um, improvements to, I think, I think especially, um, IMX Core and SAMD, and I think ESP32 got a couple, like I think the ESP32 S3 got added support. Um, so like a lot of like little port support. And here's the good news, um, we keep up with releases. So soon after 118, we will merge in all of the, the language library updates into CircuitPython so that um, we get all those improvements. And we also of course contribute back to MicroPython as well in many ways. Um, so I think this is cool. We're doing a lot of work. They're doing a lot of work. And together, uh, we're bringing more people into doing um, Python on hardware, which is what it's all about. It's yeah. not just it's the Circuit Python newsletter, newsletter. It's the Python on hardware newsletter. Yeah, and there's a million different flavors of MicroPython, and there's other ways to do Python on hardware. There's Blinka. There's stuff on Linux. Then there's CircuitPython, gives you all the hardware support and all the libraries and all the different hardware. So anyways, exciting time to be a developer. So if you want, um, please uh, check out the newsletter. Um, You can get it at Adafruit Daily, delivered to your mailbox every single week. It's uh, separate from the Adafruit.com site because we hate spam even more than you do. And so Adafruit Daily is where you go. Um, You sign up there. It has nothing to do with your store account. We don't harvest emails. We don't do anything like that never will and uh that's where you get it and that's this week's python on hardware news thanks blinka all right open source hardware news we're an open source hardware company to prove it uh not only do we post up all of our files and all of our code under open source licenses but we have 2000 610 guides. Lady Ada, what is on the big board this week? Um, well, we had a couple of updates. These are these are guides that got updates. We've been updating templates and uh, improving documentation. We're doing um, a lot of work with uh, recent boards, but we'll uh, be updating some of the older ones as well. But we're adding uh, nicer diagrams and um, more getting started tutorials. So uh, these boards are some of those that got updates. Okay. Do you want to go to the next one? Uh, also, some new guides uh, this week, um, and also more updated. So the uh, Adafruit NRI52840 Feather, I think it got updated to add um, code so you could turn it into a sniffer. Um, that got updated, and we've also been adding more to the ESP32 S2 TFT Feather guide. Uh, for new guides this week, we've got the NeoTrinky Auto Screen Locker by Carter. This is a code. This is actually a, a codeless project. It just uses the Trinky as a as something that, you know, when you yank it out of your computer, um, it'll auto lock the screen. So it's kind of like a little a quick security thing. We saw some people making projects like this. Uh, the Neo Trinky does a great job. And because it is just a PCB, it doesn't get stuck in the slot. So you can pull it out and, you know, you're not going to like yank your computer off the table. And then Noan Pedro did a 3D printed Tuscan uh, Raider staff. And we'll, uh, I think we have a video for it shortly. Okay. Um, let's look at some made in New York City factory footage.
and it wouldn't be factory footage unless you saw our view being blocked by the Disney building being built across the street. I hope the elementals was worth it. Anyways, let's do some 3D printing. You know, just on a side note, if your name's Icarus, you're probably gonna end up flying into the sun. Like if yeah. if that's your name, like you're kind kind you of You only have one job. Kind of like if 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 your name is Stormfield, you are going to be a newscaster and you're gonna do the weather. And you're gonna do like tornado watch. Probably. All right, so we're gonna play the two videos back to back. We got the Tuscan Raider and the uh, speed up, which is a fun little Mario thing. Take it away, Noam Pedro. Hey, what's up folks? In this video, we're making a prop from Star Wars, the book of Boba. We were inspired by episode three of the Book of Boba. The chief of the Tusken Raiders yields a staff that we thought would be really cool to remake. We designed and 3D printed several pieces to make the staff. We printed them in different colors so they're ready to go right off the printer. They can be printed without any supports and they don't need any screws or glue. Each piece features a threaded connector so it's really easy to assemble and take it apart. Start by installing the pipes to the handle by screwing them together. Four of these pieces are then joined with a coupler in between. Together, this makes a length of about 4 feet or 1.2 meters. There's two special pipes with fins that are connected together with this collar. The tip also has fins and just screws on top. Now we can attach the upper pipes to the handle and fasten them together. To finish this off, tighten all the pieces so they're nice and secured. We hope this inspires you to get creative and make your own props from your favorite TV shows or movies. Thanks so much for watching and don't forget to subscribe for more projects from Adafruit. And don't forget, you can learn how to make all this stuff and more on 3D Hangouts with Noam Pedro every Wednesday. So uh, we interrupt this broadcast to tell you uh, we're going to be posting up Ion MPI tomorrow because here's what's happening. You order stuff, and Ion MPI is the hottest new products from DigiKey. And uh, there's snowstorms, there's the shipping delays. Not DigiKey's fault. This is just it's, because... It's, 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 it's my fault. But the weather didn't help. Yeah. yeah <laughs> Usually the, I can make up for it with a... With yeah. overnight so, shipping and that so our NPI is uh, arriving tomorrow, and we're going to post up the video uh, as a standalone video, which we do anyway. So stay tuned for that, and we'll get the word Thank out. Thank you. Everything. Thanks for your patience. Um, don't forget, the code is magnetic. 10% off in the Adafruit store, and you get just free stuff if you load up your cart and more. Let's do new products. Let's do it. New, new. All right, so uh, first up. Thank you for singing with me. Yes. Not a good singer, good engineer. Okay, first up, we've got, this is the most handy thing in the world. In fact, last night I was like reworking a couple boards and you know, like you sit there and you're reworking and you're holding the hot air gun and you're like, this is always gonna take like 30 seconds more than you'd like. Like your arm starts to hurt and your shoulder aches a little bit. What if you had a thing that would hold up the hot air wand for you in the exact right location and it was adjustable and then you didn't have to, um, uh, hold it. Well, this is what this tool does, as shown here with, and you know, I have a PCB holder uh, that's um, these little uh, handy PCB holder uh, magnetic doodads. Um, it's got a base. It's got like this rod. It's got two like rigs with uh, three set screws that you can use to like, you know, quickly tighten and, and to attach the um, hot air wand. And that way um, you don't have to hold it. So I'm taking this one home because I am so tired of having to hold up this this wand while I'm especially for like four layer boards with a gigantic ground plane and I just want to like reseat one QFN. Um, this is going to really help me out. 
Let me give everyone a little dash of philosophy too. So that arm is a good solution um, for electronics. But uh, fun, fun thing to consider, yeah. uh, get a glass of water, hold it out, and see how long you can hold your hand out. Eventually your hand gets tired. To me, that represents grudges, and people shouldn't uh, hold on to them for so long. You can pour the glass of water out, you can put the glass down, but you have to, you can't just do that. And so, like your arm's tired, you can get, you can, you can help it with this thing, and you don't have to hold a grudge. You don't have to be in pain. Uh, but I like my grudges. <laughs> what are you talking about? All right. They give me life. Yeah. All right. So, All anyways, right. This, um, this is a very nice holder, and it comes with uh, two sizes. Um, I think all the ones that I used were the small size, but you have both and you can choose to just don't attach the one you don't want or attach both, whatever. Yeah. Go to town. Um, yeah. Like this is the most, like, I kind of wish that this would come with hot air stations, but I understand why it's, it's something you have to buy separately. But, um, I bought it in a fit of, um, desperation because I, my, I don't want my reworkout to become a workout. Yeah. All right. Um, next up. Um, next up these cute magnetic, uh, connectors which um, they, uh, re actually this image is a little unclear, but maybe I'll show it on the overhead. So. Yeah, well, you know what I'm gonna show There's here. two pieces. Yeah. And there's, there's three sizes. There's a three, four, and five pin connection. Do you want me to show all these and then we'll do the overhead? No, let's go to the overhead and then we'll show, we'll oh, show yeah. them. Oh yeah, because we got the different sizes. Yeah, but it's, it's uh, I wanna, you know. You wanna, show, just, you wanna do your I thing? Got, I have a thing. All right. I believe that. Go for it. I know what I'm doing here. DIY okay. little bits or something. So basically, um, if you have a, uh, if, whoa. Okay. If you've got like a um, old Mac laptop, you might, you know, be familiar with the, the power plug that like, um, MagSafe. the MagSafe power plug. So this is like that. Also like sometimes phones or like uh, wearables uh, use these connectors because they're very easy to waterproof because there's, you know, you can, um, you don't have any exposed contacts other than like these pogo pins. Um, so they're much more rugged and durable. Also, you don't have to worry about things getting yanked out or, or, or getting uh, pulled off and possibly damaging a connector. Um, so each connector has, you know, three to five uh, pogo pins on one side and they're like little uh, squishy pads here. This is a squishy pad part. And they have a right angle uh, 0.1 inch header, which means that they fit perfectly into a perf board for easy soldering and mounting. So for example, like, you know, it's actually kind of nice. You could put it here and then you have another piece um, and you could snap it together. This, I just, we just edge mounted it because it's kind of fun. And then this is the matching side, which has uh, another two magnets on the end. And the magnets are like, you know, north and south are flipped. So um, it does connect correctly one way, but if you flip this around, um, it will not connect, it fights you, right? Because the magnets don't line up it'll naturally want to uh, connect. If I like, even if I hold it backwards, it'll go. Oh, well, if it's connected to something, it won't do that. But it'll magically snap and align. That's cool. So that the five pins are connect, correct. So you get, there's a three pin, a five pin, and a four pin version. Kind of like docking things. Like yeah, that. it's like, I think it can be cool. Like we can have circuitry and this can carry power and data. So you can have multiple boards and you know, three, five and four pin means it's like you can do you know, you are I squared C power. This is um, cool. You know, one wire. And uh, I like particularly the ones, you know, you can always bend these pads, but I like these right angle ones because you get nice long uh, contacts and uh, they're very easy to solder and it works with like any existing design that has a uh, header contact. It just yeah. plugs in or solders in. That's cool. Yeah. This is neat. This is a very like. These are very fun. Thing, yeah. And they're finally, they're not cheap i'll say but well, they're magnets they're magnetic and you know magnets are expensive and and they're precision and you know getting one offs is, is not so cheap but believe me you couldn't get these a couple of years ago and i was looking and i was looking and i was looking trying to get them um but now that they're they're more generic and you can actually pick them up in uh, multiple sizes that's so cool okay next up next up uh, and this is actually also you know the star of the show we've revised um our seven segment backpacks they're the same size, the same pinouts, the same everything, except I kind of redid the back. Um, I improved the design a little bit, and I made them STEM IQT compatible. So um, if you want, you can use the old ones. That's fine. And you want to use the new one. Um, the back has... Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, start of the show tonight beside you, Lady Aiden, and one of our customers, our team, and the community. It's this. Yeah. I'll just show the other things for That's it. fine. Yeah. I, they're, they're beautiful and animated. Yeah. 
Uh, on the back are two stem QT connectors, and you can chain Do them. Do we show the product? Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, like, let's yeah. go to the overhead, and I'll show it because it's it's a little more clear that way. Yeah, I want to show these photos. Okay. That's fine. Well, this is the the board, and yeah. then it's like it's stacking on with red, yellow, green, blue. Um, so this is it with the matrix soldered on. Usually it comes bare, and you solder on whatever color you like. There you go. Uh, and you get the clock display with decimals and uh, colon. It's still got the HT sixteen K thirty three, which uh, is a really great low cost chip. Um, I actually brought in the pads a little bit to make it easier to solder. There's a power LED, which you can um, cut the trace if you don't want it. And then there's two vertical stem QT connectors. And so um, here we've got a demo of a QT Pi board with the stem QT cable plugged into the back. And it's just like running the demo. And there's like, you know, you just plug and play it. So um, I do eventually want to get these uh, pre-soldered like with the um, light box in them for now they're still a kit but i'm getting closer now that at least um this has a little bit more space it's easier to solder and uh you can plug and play up to eight of them on one i squared c bus because the address can be selected on the back there's uh three jumpers to select up to eight different addresses so the backpack you know and loves one of our early products um, people really like this and it makes it really easy to add seven segment displays and now you can plug and play them with stomach qt and that's new products. Yay. All right, y'all, don't forget the code's magnetic. 10% off the native fruit store up till 11.59 p.m. Probably even a little bit later because what's happening is I've been getting up so early that it's hard for me to stay up past 11. Ten, I kind yeah. of just like crash out. So you might have a chance, but you should still try to do it by, by midnight. Um, let's uh, go to Top Secret, and then we'll answer your questions. Post them up in Discord, adafruit.it slash Discord. If we're not around, don't worry. There's 32,000 of us around all the time at some point. But uh, we're going to get to your questions right away. Let's do some Top Secret first, though. Ooh, let's look in the vault. From the vault. Um, so I'm going to play two fast videos. It's ESP32 Pico and the Cutie Pie ESP32 S2, and then we're going to talk about some of the new stuff we got. Hey, Lady Data, what is this? Hey, I just got some samples of these new ESP32 Pico modules. I got a cut tape of 10 pieces. And what's interesting is um, I actually kind of didn't realize that these are not the same size as the ESP32 S2 modules. They're like kind of like significantly smaller, which is actually good news because I, like, you know, I was talking earlier a few weeks ago, I wanted to make an itsy bitsy ESP32, and this like will just fit right in between perfectly and not get in the way of the pads. It'll just have to put the silk screen on the bottom. Um, and then I just need a CP2102 and um, the power supply. But, you know, even if I can't quite fit it here, I can put some parts on the bottom maybe. So I think an itsy bitsy ESP32 is in the cards and it'll have PS RAM because the Pico comes with two megabytes of PS RAM. So it's kind of cool. So cute. Hi, right, Lady, what is this? This is me testing out prototypes for a new Cutie Pie board. It looks a lot like the ESP32 S2 uh, Cutie Pie that we recently released, but this is the S3. It's a dual, co dual core Tensilica 240 megahertz processor with Wi-Fi and BLE, so it adds a second core and BLE compared to the S2. This is a really new chip, so support is still like very much in progress. Um, but we do have the beginnings of CircuitPython with Wi-Fi working on it, including some peripherals. So this is um, me running the um, Wi-Fi demo. And um, thanks to Scott, who fixed a couple of hard faults. I can connect to Wi-Fi. I can um, connect to you know GitHub and get the number of GitHub stars. So it's slowly coming up. Um, still a couple of things to work out. But um, this new, very powerful Cutie Pie is going to be in the store soon. All right, and then you got a new feather. Yes, this is the new ESP32 feather. So it got like a huge redesign um, with that Pico board and now has two megabytes of PS RAM and um, I think eight megabytes of flash. I think that the Pico has like double double. And um, also the USB serial converter can be a, a CP2102N or CP2104. At a stomach QT connector, USB C. It's just like a big re rerun, you know. Like I kind of cleaned up everything and, and redid a bunch. Um, added an extra user button because there was an extra like single pin. A few a few GPIO had to get shuffled because the Pico doesn't expose every pad, but I think it's worth it. So I'm going to call this a V2. It's a new product, 
but I think you know people should upgrade. It'll probably have a lot more functionality, um, and uh, more power supply options, and more memory. Of course, uh, I think it's a worthwhile upgrade. And next up, this is the preview. We have pink JST connectors. Yes, I have to actually try them out. But uh, next time I build a board with JST yeah. connectors, I haven't had. We're gonna have to do pink that. boards with pink JST connectors. We're gonna uh, black boards with pink JST connectors. We're gonna see which looks best. We're gonna mm. try them out, and then we're just gonna start doing it. Yeah. And that's top secret. Okay, we're gonna roll right into questions, and we're gonna get out of here. So I have a few lined up from the chats. Yes. And I'm going to start getting to those now. Okay, first question, Lady Ada, question for the chat. The ESP32 S2 Feathers, can I plug in any solar panel into USB for charging an attached LiPo battery? Is it smart enough to handle the over-under voltage? Absolutely not. You can't do that. You need a specialty uh, solar charger, um, which is we, we stock separately. It uses a different chip. It's much more expensive. It's much bigger. Um, and then you can use that to generate, um, you know, the, the, to, to manage the battery, and then you take the load out from that, and you can use that to power your circuit. Okay. Next up, 24-volt power supply to 5-volt for ESP32, buck converter or voltage regulator? I think you probably want a buck converter. Otherwise, you're going to dissipate a lot of power as heat. Okay, question. My work respawned a board to accommodate a BGA chip versus QFP chip due to the chip shortage. Can you, uh, oh, sorry, but our normal board supplier cannot make the board anymore because of the BGA. Is this common? Can you briefly explain why and perhaps touch on the different levels of sophistication quality of board houses? Um, that's unusual that a board house won't do a BGA unless there's something you're doing like, um, via and pad and you need plugged vias like there's there the pga is probably not the issue it's probably something else that got added to your board design because of the bga because bgas aren't that fine pitch um they're, they're annoying they're complicated and they're hard to rework but they're not fine pitch they're usually you know 0.5 mil pitch or higher um but it's probably some technology that you added um to your stack up that has made it so your board house doesn't like it anymore and that, that's up to you gotta talk to your board house what is it that they can't actually do okay uh, next up, when will there be a Neo Key five by six ortho snap apart for chalk? Switches? No idea. Okay. They're not that popular, to be honest. Next up, uh, the Feather NRF 52840 since doesn't seem to have an onboard PCB crystal oscillator like many of the other feathers. What drove the design decisions? Is there a big difference between the clock accuracy versus other feathers? There is a crystal. You just can't see it. It's in the module. Whoa. Um, next up. Uh, do we ever work with CNC machinists for any parts? Um, not often. Okay. Usually, we, you know, we laser cut stuff, but we don't usually uh, use CNC in our processes. Next up, uh, part shortage. Is it getting any easier for you to get the parts you need? No, it's in fact getting a little bit harder um, because some parts are, they start to just get discontinued. Like we have them on order. Um, and you know, for a few months we could we held over with what our stock had, but it's actually getting it, it's getting tougher to get some parts. And even though we've booked them, um, they just get pushed out. Like we have orders that we booked a year ago that were promised for months, you know, and then it's now a year, and it's like we still don't have the parts. So um, it it is. It, you'd think it would get you'd get more used to it, but it actually doesn't. It actually gets a little tougher um, because it's hard to trust anything. So everything is just you know. What I mean, if you're like it, it's. It's not the part shortage that's the problem. It's not knowing when the part shortage is going to end that's the problem. I think this is like the frog boil thing where it's like it's been one degree hotter, one degree hotter, one degree hotter, and eventually, like right now, it's like, ow, we're boiling. Yeah, um, the anyways. TFT prices have come back down, so that at least got some yeah. result. Would the feather wing for floppy drives work with an internal floppies, uh, for example, a internal floppy on a PowerBook 145? Not sure the level of work if we use a breakup board. Probably not well. a PowerBook because Mac floppies were much different, and they I, they may not have used the same sugar interface. Um, so they are they are different. Um, Mac floppies in in a certain era, which you know had variable speed drives like the super drive were were kind of a nightmare it, it, eventually um there was a period i think where they stopped supporting old floppy okay. disks but basically no it's it's really going to work best with pc floppies all right squirrel oak we got to the esp 32s2 feather question about the solar panel just uh, hit rewind on the video you can also wait till the video is done uh it's just a few minutes back um the answer is you're going to need another device um and lady Ada goes over that 
Question, I asked this on the site, but wanted to add a thought. You are revising ESP32 boards. Any plans to add a stem port on any of them? Uh, it can make Whipper Snapper easy to connect a PR sensor. Ideally, sorry, preferably like the pin to be uh, interrupt capable for deep sleep wake up projects. I know it's easy to solder, but you know, like easy, quick. That's like the fun house. There's really no space. I mean, you could plug this into like a Grove wing or something, but if you're, if you're looking for Something that's whippersnapper that you can plug in stuff without any soldering, that's the Funhouse board. Okay. Uh, after an awesome great search about PCB wire terminals, I fell in love with some corded wire terminals on DigiKey. Do you think I can use those in design or will it make the ANSI ISO people mad? You can do whatever you want. I don't, I don't care. Yeah. Oh. They're meant to be used. Uh, I think... Uh, if the software is in place with an IBM compatible 5.0 two five inch floppy drive be able to read write Commodore floppies? I think so. I think Commodore 64 floppies are read, read and writable from a standard five and a quarter inch disk drive. I mean, like I, I was able to read some Commodore 64 diskettes. Um, not the copy, not the copy protection stuff. I'm still trying to figure out whether it can, it can do that. It can't easily do the flippy disk part, like flipping over the disks, the double sided where you actually like take it out and rotate it because some Commodore 64s, you literally had to remove the diskette and flip it upside down, whereas modern five and a quarter drives have two heads. Um, so this is what I call the flippy disk. Um, there's a lot of things where it's like, floppy disks are, are fascinating. They're, they're a lot more incompatible than I thought. Even, even some things as simple as like, well, you're just reading flux you know, everybody how, wanted how hard their own kingdom, be? and they made it all different, so nothing worked with each it, other. It's it's actually a little surprising. It's like there's there are some real weirdnesses, but I believe the 1541 diskettes, single the single side, you can just read and write um, with something like Adafruit floppy on on a standard five and a quarter inch PC disk drive because inside the 1541, I have one that we picked up for like twenty bucks. And I believe they actually just used a standard off the shelf, five and a quarter inch drive, and then just added their, you know, their controller, their 8051 controller on top. But it's, it's very hard to get consistent information about this. Um, it's out there, but it's a little, I don't want to say gate kept, but it's a little bit gate kept. It's not. Oh, I'll say it. Um, yeah, so there's a couple things going on. A lot of the websites are older and they're not being maintained and the domain names are gone away and it's in forums that don't work anymore. And then some of the people um, are super gatekeepy and they don't want uh, beginners in. They don't want uh, people like Lamore in. And so we're doing everything in the open and we're doing open source, but that's one of the things that happened with electronics. Uh, speaking of 15, 16 years ago, yeah. um, there was a bunch of gatekeepy folks that didn't want people like you and people that are beginners into um, the electronic community and they, they purposely kept everyone out and that tension still exists now especially with retro stuff but it's changing because the Adafruit community is really interested in this and everyone's sharing and folks are helping each other out and the Adafruit floppy stuff is open source and I think folks are gonna help make it better yeah okay next up um, do the mag connectors come with pogo pads on both sides? No, there's pogo pins on one side. If there was pogo pads on both sides, they would it would not fit very well. Like you want one side flat okay. and one side springy. All right. Uh, do you have any suggestions for dealing with noise on I2C? I have a strong 1K pull-ups, but still having communication errors eventually after minutes of connection. You can slow down your speed. You can use an active terminator. Um, You can um, make sure that your, your I2C and data lines are not next to each other. Make sure your power supply is good, like your ground isn't floating around. Um, those are some of the things. That, by the way, I2C, I will say, it was not designed for more than four or five inches, really. That's max, max, but we, we are abusing this uh, interface with wire, so you'll, you may need an active terminator. It does help quite a bit. Okay. Um, so folks have some suggestions. The guy who does the Adrian Basement channel, he knows the comment over stuff by heart. I'll check that out. And yeah, then... there's, 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 you know, the Commodore stuff, and there's the, you know, how, what you have to do with the diskette. It's a lot of Commodore people like to use the 1541 disk drive. And then, and then, I, as far as I can tell, they solder wires onto the data output port and then connect it to a parallel port, like a USB to parallel converter, and read the data that way. And that, I don't quite, 
get why. I haven't quite figured out why is that the way you have to do it. Why not just read fluxes off of, in, you know, a, a standard PC disk drive? You don't have to MFM decode them. Um, this should be possible, right? I, I know that there's there's a reason why some Mac floppies you can't do that, but for um, GCR, there's I, I don't believe there's any reason you can't. But again, this is a lot of the data is a lot of the stuff that people are talking about. It was a lot of people were doing this hacking in the '90s when there was there was restrictions on what you could do. Like it was actually easier to get a parallel port than it was yeah. to get a microcontroller with 128k of RAM. If you have a microcontroller with 120k of RAM, like there might be ways around some of these restrictions to like buffer an entire track and then do the GCR decoding and, and do the analysis. Um, yeah, we have boards with like four megabytes of storage. I mean, like you yeah, can do, you can do a lot more now. It basically, it's un, it's unclear to me at this time. Okay, um, folks have requests for SCSI and tape backup drives. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, it's going to be it's an open source project. We'll see what happens. Uh, I think that is it. Okay, we got to everything. Got to everything. All okay, right, thanks everybody. so that is our show tonight, everybody. Don't forget the code is magnetic. That'll be going until uh, either I fall asleep or I wake up. One of those two things. Sch Schrodinger's fill box. Um, is it a sleep fill or is it a wake fill? Um, either way, the code's going to go okay. until uh, I remember to turn it off. So fill up your cart and more. 10% off. All the stuff that's in stock. Thank you for your support, everybody. Thank you to our community, our customers, our folks behind the scenes. Jesse May is in the Slack chat tonight. Hello, Jesse May. Um, all of the Adafruit team members, all the folks in the chat. Um, special thanks to New York keeping it together. It's been... A grind but we're getting through and uh, we'll see everybody next week same time same place ask an engineer this is an adafruit production boop, 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 boop. and uh, here's a moment of zener bye, bye everybody, everybody.